Man, well, thank you guys. It's, it's nice to meet you guys. My name is Justin. I am the church planting resident right now at Redeemer Lubbock and am planting uh, New City Church in Austin next year. And so, um, uh, so yeah, we, we need to hang out. Um, the, um, so if, you, if you're unfamiliar with what like a church planting residency is, um, uh, I am partnering with Redeemer Church in Lubbock, who has planted several churches before and kind of experts in that field and stuff. And, and I am on staff there, have been for about a year and a half now. I got about another half of a year. Um, and I'm just kind of in this prep mode where I have been being trained and learning and all that stuff, but also preparing and dreaming and recruiting a core team and staff team and training them now and that kind of a thing. And so a bunch of us, uh, a few few folks this summer will move to Austin, and then some of us will move closer to January of this year or next year, and then uh, probably the big bulk of our core team will move next summer. And so, um, so yeah, we're excited about it. I'm, 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 I'm stoked about it. Today, I, I'm assuming that you are here because you have some sort of desire to be a better uh, preacher or teacher. Um, and and that's, a, that's a good desire to have. Um, whether you are the lead college director or whether you are a lead pastor or whether you are uh, just on staff on a college team or, or whatever it is, you will preach, you will teach. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that. You will uh, be in the environments that we're going to, to, to explain and, and talk about uh, today. And so uh, this applies to, to, to everyone here, which normally at a breakout, that's not something you need to uh, say. But I know many of you probably are not going to be behind the pulpit preaching to a large crowd. I want you to know this is going to apply, hopefully, to any kind of teaching environment, uh, form of teaching that you do uh, and stuff. It, it may seem like, because I am a regular preacher, meaning I preach regularly, I'm also a, an extremely regular preacher. Um, uh, but the, um, it may seem like I'm talking about kind of larger groups and preaching. In fact, we will talk about preaching at the end of this uh, breakout. Um, but the hope is to kind of just for me to talk about what, what I do and, and um, uh, what I'm good at. And hopefully you can kind of apply that to whatever environment you imagine yourself in. Um, and hopefully that'll be good. I, I hope it will be. Um, so if you got your Bible, we're going to be opening our Bible a few times. Uh, turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Um, it's a passage I hope all of you are familiar with. Um, one thing that I want to say before we, we read is uh, in no way do I view myself as an expert on preaching and teaching, that kind of a thing. Um, or am I an expert on spiritual formation and discipleship and that kind of a thing? I, I am I'm learning right alongside all of you. Um, I've been uh, doing some sort of form of teaching uh, formally for um, probably close to 10 years now. Um, uh, but man, I, I have so many people in my life that are constantly speaking into my teaching ministry and, and helping me get better and, you know, books and stuff. I'll point you to, to these things and stuff that are, a lot of this information is not um, original to me. Uh, this is not just something that I came up with, in, like the best preaching method in, in history or whatever, and I'm claiming it. That's not at all what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to feed you information that has been fed to me over the last 10 years and kind of interpret it through my experience of a lot of bad teaching and preaching and, uh, and, and to help you out, okay? So we're in this together. In fact, uh, my hope is, uh, because this is an hour 15, uh, minutes, whatever, breakout, my hope is, is that we can uh, uh, get done with kind of the, the lecture would be the wrong word, but get done with me talking um, uh, quickly and so that we can actually talk about, we can ask some questions and, and I, don't, I don't want it to be a Q&A with me. I want it to be, um, I know there are many experienced teachers in the room. And so uh, 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 just if you've got questions and stuff, we're gonna ask them to the group. We're gonna ask them to the community. We'll learn in community, okay? Which we'll talk about because that's an important thing when it comes to teaching, okay? So Matthew 28. Um, this is right after Jesus has resurrected. He's about to ascend back to the right hand of the Father. And he says, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is verse 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or obey 
all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so at the, at the end of his ministry, at the end of his um, life on earth, uh, uh, Jesus has got all of the people that he has um, been rabbi to, which that's a Hebrew word for, for teacher, that he's been teacher for, for the past you know three or so years. And he's at the end of this ministry, and they've been walking with him, they've been observing everything that he's done, they've been listening to everything that he said, they've gotten to hear his teaching, they've also gotten to watch him teach other people. They, they, all this stuff has happened, and at the end of his ministry, he tells those 11 and plus people to say, hey, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. So he says in, in the command to go and make disciples, which I would argue is the person, the purpose of the church, right? Dahadi said that um, uh, this morning, uh, that it's not a ministry that the church does, it's the ministry. That what we exist for is the, the multiplication of disciples. We're making disciples, recruiting followers of Jesus around the world. And, uh, and he gives two uh, subheadings to that make disciples thing. Just two. Baptizing them, it seems kind of obvious, and then teaching them. And so if we are to be uh, faithful to, to Jesus' call to us as not just ministry leaders, but as followers of Jesus, but if we are to be faithful um, to our call that Jesus has given to, to ministry leaders, um, to those ones who are sent out, to those apostles, little a, um, uh, that, that Jesus has sent out, um, if we're going to be faithful to that calling, then we must be effective teachers. Because it's one of two things Jesus says is involved in making disciples. It's one of two, it's very, very, very important is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, and so um, we want to make sure that we are uh, faithful to his calling. And so we want to think about teaching really, really, really well. And, and that's what I hope we're going to do uh, today. So first, let's, uh, let's talk about the goal of teaching. All right, so uh, teaching in the sense that Jesus is using it here, as I mentioned, is a subheading or a, a subcategory or like a subcommand under the main overarching command to go and make disciples, right? And, and so the purpose of teaching, as Jesus is using the word here, is to make disciples, all right? Are, are you with me? Now, here's what I think Jesus means by make disciples. I don't think he means just evangelism, okay? And what I mean by that is I don't think he's just saying go out on the streets and share the gospel and produce converts, right? I think when he's saying make disciples, what he is essentially saying is I want you to go to all nations and I want you to do what I have done for you in the last three years for other people. And so uh, uh, when he says teaching... Um, and, and when he's talking about baptizing and teaching, that what he has in mind in the teaching per portion is an entire strategy for forming people into disciples, making disciples. Are you with me? And, uh, and so you ask the question, what's the goal of being a disciple? Like, what is a disciple? Most literally, it's like a student or an apprentice, but like a disciple of Jesus, what is the goal of of being a disciple, because that will tell us what the goal of teaching to make disciples is. Are, you, are everybody with me? Um, so what is the goal for being a disciple? Well, Paul is really clear that the goal for, that God has for his people, this is Romans 8, 29, um, uh, is for them to be conformed into the image of the Son. That the, the goal of being a disciple of Jesus is to become like Jesus to be formed into who God created you to be, all right? This is where we get the language, that, that passage, uh, to be conformed into the image of the Son, and then a passage later on in Romans 12 that says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, not conformed to the world. That's where we get this language of spiritual formation. That's very popular now um, uh, because of folks like John Mark Comer and Pete Scazzaro and stuff like that. Um, but but that's, that's what we mean by spiritual formation, is, is helping people to become more like Jesus, right? Um, and so the goal of teaching in the church, no matter what we're talking about, we'll talk about what we like teaching, we're using the word very broadly right now. Um, uh, in all of the things that would fall under the umbrella of teaching, the goal of it is to form people into the image of Jesus, okay? Um, all right, so let's talk about 
real quick the word teaching um, and the way we're going to use it, and then, uh, and then we'll be able to kind of really dig deep into this. So, like I mentioned, this is the end of Jesus' ministry with his disciples. And, and I think this, this thing, like, like I said, this great commission is a command to go and do all the things that Jesus has done for his disciples over the last three years, right? And so when he says teaching them to obey all that he has commanded, um, I think what he is doing is summarizing basically all of what he has done for the past three years. You get what I'm saying? So he's saying, uh, when you go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then also teach them, using that word very broadly, in the same way that I have taught you, in the, in the way that you got to watch me te- teach other people. So then the question is, if we're going to think about, okay, well, how do we talk about teaching, how do we divide teaching up in the very different ways that teaching happens, right? Um, uh, well, then let's, let's look. What did Jesus do with his disciples over the last three years? So then you go back to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew is a very good author, and he likes to do this thing called foreshadowing, or I don't know if that's even the correct literary term. It's been a long time since I took high school English. But you, you can go back to Matthew 4, and we'll see exactly what Jesus' strategy for, quote-unquote, teaching his disciples um, to obey all that he's commanding. So Matthew 4, this is right after he has recruited his first disciples, And what did he say to his first disciples? He said, follow me and I will make you, it's the same word, make you into fishers of men, right? Uh, So he is saying at this point, if this is the first time you've ever read Matthew, you don't know this, but you've probably read Matthew. You've at least heard the Great Commission before. And so you know when Jesus says, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men, you're thinking about the Great Commission. That, that, That's accomplished by Matthew 28. That they are now fishers of men. And he's saying, Go fish for men. I've trained you, now it's time to go. So at the very beginning of their training, kind of on orientation day, if you will, he says, he says follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And then in Matthew 4, 23, this is what he says. He says, and he went, that's Jesus, throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Okay, so you've got this kind of uh, um, this, this summary that Matthew gives us of Jesus' ministry for the rest of the book. Okay, but it's in the context of him recruiting his first disciples and saying, I will make you into fishers of men. So, so this is Jesus' kind of syllabus, if you will. This is, this is like, these are all the things that I'm going to do to you, with you, in front of you, to train you, to form you into the kind of person I want you to be so that you can go and fish for men like I just talked about. Everybody's still with me on what Jesus is doing? And this is also, just to kind of point this out about the Gospel of Matthew, um, this is also, you can think of it kind of like a a chapter heading of a book in Matthew's uh, narrative about Jesus' life. So you get this sentence. This is like like the the beginning of the next section, basically, in Matthew in in 4.23. You get this sentence that he goes throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, that's Matthew 5 through 7, Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And then Matthew 9 or Matthew 8 and 9, healing every affliction, healing the sick and uh, every affliction among the people. So Matthew is also giving you a, like, uh, a, a table of contents for the next several chapters of his book. And you can look, Matthew 5 through 7, if you had a traditional Bible, it would be all in red. And then 8 and 9, it's all stories of him healing somebody, casting out demons, that kind of a thing. But then what happens in chapter 10? In chapter 10, he gathers all 12 of his disciples, and he says this. Well, first, there's the kind of bookend. Matthew says, and Jesus, in Matthew 10, or sorry, Matthew 9, 35, Jesus, uh, Matthew says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. It's an identical sentence. So it's a bookend. Matthew's saying, okay, this is the end of this section. So, so Jesus says, and I, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, Jesus recruits his disciples, and he says, I'm going to make you in the fishers of men. He teaches, he preaches, and he demonstrates the gospel. Okay? And then you get an example of that in the gospel of Matthew. You get three chapters of teaching and preaching, and you get two chapters of healing every affliction and casting out demons. And then chapter, you get the book in, same exact sentence. And then in chapter 10, look what he calls his disciples to do. 
chapter 10, verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. He's saying, okay, now you've watched me do all of this. Now you go and do it, right? So this is the goal of Jesus' teaching. And, and this is how he does it. And so what I want to do is talk about these three words, well, two words and a concept that uh, occur in Matthew 4, where it says that Jesus went teaching, proclaiming, or preaching, and uh, the, the text says healing every disease and every affliction among the people. I'm going to use the word demonstrating, but then when it comes to actually, like when we're thinking about teaching somebody this stuff, I'm going to use the word training. Okay, so, um, and I'm gonna explain this in a second, but you wanna write down these words because we're gonna be talking about them. So, about three different forms of uh, the overall um, concept of teaching. And this is gonna be confusing because I'm gonna use the word teaching twice to mean two different things. Okay, there's the umbrella term of, term of teaching that was used in Matthew 28, and then there's the subcategory of teaching. That's the Greek word um, that we get the English word didactic from. Um, uh, um, is there's teaching. And then there's preaching, which is the Greek word kariso. It means to proclaim, to herald, um, it means like, like a messenger with good news, to preach the gospel. There's two different words there. So you've got um, uh, teaching, and you've got preaching, and then you've got training. And these are three different ways that we, it's confusing, teach our people, okay? Um, so we're going to get there. But first, we need to think, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to give that to you so that you can think about what we're going to talk about, think about that while we, while we talk about what we're going to talk about next, which is what forms people. Okay, so if we're going to teach, umbrella term, people to become more like Jesus, to obey all that he has commanded, to be disciples, to, to teach for spiritual formation, one of the questions, the first question we've got to ask is how Jesus did it. We're going to continue talking about that in a little bit. But then now the second question we've got to ask is how are people actually formed? What actually changes people? Okay? And so here's what I want to offer to you here is, is a reality and then three ways that that reality is happening. Okay? Here, here you can call this a, a working theory of change. And, and that's very intentional language. Working meaning this is not Gospel, this isn't, you're not going to find this in the Bible, um, and, uh, and it is taken, I didn't just make it up, uh, but it is like written in pencil, and I'm very open to critique and um, improvement on this. But in my experience and, and what I've heard from, from folks who are more experienced than me, this is, this is what I'm working with right now when I think about my teaching ministry, um, uh, and then it's a theory, right? So it's working, I want it to improve, it's also a theory. There's no scientific proof of any of this, okay? So, um, uh, so here, here's the deal. Here's the reality. I told you, a reality and then three ways this reality is happening. The reality is your people are being formed whether you teach them or not. Your people are being formed and have been formed before you ever say a word to them. You guys are in college ministry. Your people, when they get to you in your ministry, let's say freshman year at 18, they have gone through 18 years of formation before you say a word to them. And they will continue to be formed at an exponentially faster rate in college, by the way, um, uh, whether you teach them or not. Uh, the question is not whether or not your people or you yourself are being formed. The question is to what you are being formed into. Um, and, uh, and that's really important reality. Um, because uh, we tend to think of, if, if you're not careful, we tend to think of teaching and discipleship and formation and ministry and stuff like that. Like we've got a bunch of people who are starting at zero and our job is to get them to 10. But it, 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 and, and, and praise God for those who come to our college ministries and have been formed by the church and have had great Christian parents and are, and are like, you know, they've, they've got a huge head start on the rest of the world as far as becoming more like Jesus. So they've had that teaching before. But many of your people, um, and this is not a value judgment on like how valuable they are as human beings or something like that, but many of your people, they're not starting at zero. You're getting them at negative 20, you know? And, and, and there's a lot of counter formation that has to happen because they have spent 18 years or might spend four more years or whatever being deformed by uh, what the Bible would talk about as the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, and, uh, and, and so... Uh, we're going to talk about how your people, mainly how the world is forming your people, 
has formed your people and is forming your people. There's, there's three categories uh, that I want to talk about. The first category is our stories. And I'm using our language on purpose here because you're also being formed by these things. Um, uh, it's not just your people. So we are formed, human beings are formed by our stories. I'll explain that. Our community and our habits. In other words, we are formed by what we believe, who we are around, and what we do. Okay, so let me talk about these in detail um, uh, uh, a little bit. So uh, our stories. Uh, humans are storied creatures. Uh, one psychologist one time labeled humans as meaning-making machines. You have no ability not to tell yourself a story about any given experience that you have had. You cannot do it. You are constantly interpreting the world, which means you're constantly telling yourself a story about what is happening in front of you, what you're observing. And so all of us have um, stories. It's how we make sense of everything. And it's how we answer the big questions of life, of like, why am I here? Where did I come from? Who am I? That kind of stuff. What's the purpose of life? That kind of stuff. That's how we answer those questions. Everybody's got an answer to those questions. Um, uh, whether if you ask them and they're like, I don't know, they're functioning with an actual answer. They may not have it in their head, but they're living for something, right? So that they've answered those questions. And, and, and stories um, get to you in a, in a variety of different ways. They can be passed down to you by your parents. They can, you know, you can learn them in schools, through the culture, um, just through your experiences, you know, like theoretically, this is probably not true for anybody, but like theoretically, if you lived in a vacuum and you had some experience, you would have to make up something, right? And so uh, we all have these stories and there's varieties of ways that they come um, to us. Um, uh, most of the time, you're going to find that your, your people and you yourself, your stories were passed down by authority figures in your life, by the culture, or by their experiences, and probably a mixture of all three, okay? Um, and so uh, you have these individually, like you have your own stories. I don't mean your testimony. I mean like the stories that you have going in your head about how you interpret the world, your worldview. You've got your own, but we also have them as a culture. Every single culture has dominant narratives that drive the way the people in those cultures think. And we're all, we're all a part of this. You, you may very well like to believe that you are, uh, uh, you've got a 100% biblical worldview, but you don't. Because you're an American, and you're a Texan, maybe, or you're an Iowan, or you um, are a Gen Z, or a millennial. All of those things means that you are swimming in water of stories, and you're not even aware of how it forms you. Um, and and, and that, if that's true for you, how much more is that true for your 18-year-old freshman who grew up on TikTok? You know what I mean? Like, these stories are, are, are powerful and they really do affect, they're not just what we believe, they shape the framework by which we interpret everything. Okay, so it's not just like, like so a story is not just, um, I'll use a popular cultural example, a story is not just that um, uh, marriage and sex should be for anyone as long as they love each other. That's a story, but there's a story behind that story that, um, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of stories. One of the stories would be the Bible's not authoritative. And the other story would be that um, your feelings are what should drive uh, your, your sense of reality and your calling and what is right and wrong. It should drive your decision-making. There's all kinds of stories behind the story. You, you get what I'm saying? Like somebody comes to that conclusion because of stories they believe. Um, and the way it's, it's shaped the way that they, the framework by which they interpret all of life. Let's, let's just pause here for a second. What are some of the common stories that you hear? in the culture. Do you mean like in the Christian culture or in like the world? Well, it could be either one. I would also argue that many of the stories in the Christian culture could be harmful as well. Yeah, but either one. Hmm. It's your irrational, autonomous self. Yeah. yeah. The man is naturally good. The man is naturally good, yeah. All roads lead to heaven. All roads lead to heaven, yeah. You have to be your authentic self. 
to be your authentic self, right? You've been told your whole life to not feel and conceal, but you need to let it go, right? Follow your heart, heart? yeah. My truth isn't your truth. Yeah, that truth can actually be relative. There's no truth, truth. yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly what I'm talking about. These stories, and you see it in culture, and one of the things is if you want to be a good teacher, you need to be able to see these things in culture. I pointed, I use Frozen all the time as an example, because the, a traditional culture um, was to put the family above the individual, the group or society above the individual. That's a traditional culture. That's the kind of culture that you read about in the Bible um, that still exists in many like Middle Eastern contexts and even African contexts and stuff like that. Western culture is the exact opposite of that right now. And, and you can see, watch any Disney movie, and you will know how your people think. Because, I mean, you were raised that way. I was raised that way. And, and, and you don't know it. You don't know it at all. Like It's just the water that you're swimming in. And so you really got to get good at identifying those stories. And then also knowing your people, identifying the stories that they're coming up with uh, um, and, and that are forming their lives. So that's forming people. Stories are one way that we form people. Uh, I want to spend more time on that one than the other two. Uh, uh, the next one is community, meaning just the people you're around. Um, when you're young, this is your family. When you're a child, these are your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your grandma, whoever's raising you, whatever kind of household you're in. These are the people who um, uh, really have the most formative power in your life. As you get older, it becomes your friends, your workplace, your, um, uh, uh, your, your town, uh, what, the area of the country you live in, that kind of thing. That's what I mean by community, who you're around. Um, it sounds really cre- cliche, but you really are the sum of your five closest friends. You really are that. Um, uh, and, and so, first of all, word of advice, think about those five closest friends first. Uh, and you may need to do some reevaluating before you start teaching. And two, uh, like, think about your people. They are the sum of their five closest friends. They really are. Um, and, and so, um, I'm not saying that Christians should not hang out with lost people, that kind of thing. I'm very missional. I want, but, like, your community has formation power on you. And then the second is our habits. Now, we tend to think about in the Christian world, in the evangelical conservative Christian world, because we have such an emphasis on uh, an internal experience um, for conversion and, 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 and transformation and stuff like that. And I'm not, I'm not knocking that. Um, uh, but um, we tend to think of what we do with our hands, what we do on the outside physically and stuff like that, is always a... Um, uh, uh, um, an overflow of what's on the inside. And that, that is true, 100%. Uh, you will know a tree by its fruits, right? Like that, that's 100% true. At the same time, um, what you do with your hands also can help form your heart and your mind. Does that make sense? You're a holistic being. The biblical vision for a human being is that you are a body, you are a soul, you are a mind, you are a heart. Um, you, those are not separate categories. It's kind of like the Trinity, um, right? Like those, those are distinct, but you, one is not separate from the other. There's another story in culture, by the way. Um, culture right now would tell you that you are a, a physical being inside of a cage that is a body. That's not the biblical vision for humanity. And there's a, well, I can get on a soapbox about some conservative theology about leaving the body and going to heaven, that kind of thing. But anyway, so um, we, we, like there's, there's uh, uh, what your habits, what you do really does affect um, who you are. Shane uh, alluded this to this last night about exercise, that he actually feels spiritually more healthy when he is, uh, I'll translate it to, to what we're talking about, when he is uh, working well in his physical habits. You know what I mean? So, and, and when he's not, it, it's forming him. It's changing him. He's becoming something. And your people are always becoming something. And the three ways that the world is forming them is in their stories, in their community, and in their habits. Is everybody, everybody with me? Okay. All right. So then the question is, if that's how people are formed, that's how humans are formed. Generally, Christian or non-Christian, that's how they're all formed. Stories, community, and habits How do we, how do people become more like Jesus? How are they formed into the image of Jesus specifically, right? 
And this is the beautiful thing about what God has done, I think, in, in, in um, uh, the church and in Jesus and in, in, in just the way that he set the whole thing up is that if we are formed by our stories, our community, and our habits, God has given us a new version of each that will form us into the, the image of, of Jesus, right? And so the um, story, obvious one, the story of the Bible, right? That the, the, the true story of the universe is something that you must have. There is no path to growth for anyone in Christ without the story of the Scriptures. Um, and, and this is huge. This is huge because this is, I can confidently say this about most of the people in your college ministry, if you've, unless you've got a very unique group of college students. Your people are biblically illiterate. They do not know their Bible. Um, and that's not a knock on their character. That's not at all. It's just a product of them being Gen Z. 4%, Barna says, 4% of Gen Zers have a biblical worldview. Um, now, there are famous stories from the Bible that everybody knows, but it doesn't mean that they know the story of the Bible, and it certainly doesn't mean that that story is so ingrained into their heart, mind, and soul that it's affecting the way that they live and, dis- and view the world. That what we want to do is we want to get Scripture so deep down in our people that that is what is building the frameworks for which they interpret the world, not the stories of the culture. And I can tell you that's hard. It's hard. But the Bible has functioned this way. In fact, many scholars believe that Genesis um, uh, 1, 2, and 3, the, the creation narrative, um, was uh, used when the, the Hebrew people were in uh, captivity in Babylon. That, that Genesis, the main purpose that the creation narrative served was uh, an identity uh, counterformation for Jewish children and, and for people forming them. Because the Babylonian creation narrative is that this god Marduk basically uh, just did a bunch of like really violent things and uh, created humanity out of like these materials or out of the bodies of other gods or whatever in order to uh, uh, provide slaves for lesser gods. And this is a way that the Babylonian elite would justify slavery to um, those who were on the lower classes or whatever. And so, like, can you imagine, like, you're a Babylonian kid born into this slave family. It's not just that you're like, oh, my people are oppressed and I'm, uh, you know, like this, I've gotten a, a bad hand in life, that kind of a thing. It's no, 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 like the gods created us for this. Like, that's a, that's a powerful identity, you know, formation machine there. And so, like, the Bible was used, um, some scholars would say, that the, the creation narrative, like, 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 think about how Judaism, God's people, think about how the Torah, like, how that survived Babylonian captivity. Because it's, I mean, it was so deeply ingrained in those people. We're talking about people who were born in Babylon, who were given Babylonian names, like uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Those are not Hebrew names. Those are Babylonian names. These guys are teenagers when they go, and they, they strip their identities from them. They make them eat Babylonian food, they, all, this, all this stuff. They're trying to make them into um, uh, uh, one of them, trying to assimilate them into the culture. How does somebody survive that? When their framework for interpreting the world is so shaped by the story of Scripture that, that the other stories are all getting interpreted through the lens of Scripture. Does that make sense? So that's the first way that people are formed into the image of Jesus. And by the way, I should stop here and say this is always that the Holy Spirit forms people into the image of Jesus, okay? Um, I, I don't want to uh, not acknowledge that. That when I say that people are being formed, that is the work of the Holy Spirit through these means, okay? So Scripture. Um, the uh, second one is the church. He provides people a new community, the community of God. You know, Peter says, you are now a holy nation. You were once not a people, now you are a people that God has gathered for himself. He provides for us the church. It's a new community of people who form us um, into who we are. And it trumps all other identities. You know, in Galatians, it says, in Christ there are no uh, male or female, no slave, nor free, no Jew or Gentile. Like every other um, identity marker that you have uh, will fall under 
um, uh, in, in priority and in value or whatever fall under your identity in Christ. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, you have more in common with someone halfway across the world that disagrees with you 100% politically and who um, doesn't speak the same language, likes different food, all this stuff. Someone who's absolutely different from you in every other way. You have more in common with that person if that person is a follower in Christ than you do with your Texan barbecue loving Republican voting neighbor um, right next to you. Like you have more in common with them if that, if that person's not a follower of Jesus, okay? And so um, uh, like God has provided us with a family and the primary uh, um, uh, purpose as far as uh, uh, um, for, for the people in it, the primary purpose of the church is to form people into the image of Jesus. Paul talks about spiritual gifts all the time in his letters and what are they for? To build up the body. Our whole goal as a, as a follower, uh, as, as a church, as far as, uh, uh, as far as between you and me, what we do for one another is we get together, we encourage each other, we sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. We we build one each other, uh, one another up. You know what I mean? We're helping each other form, um, become formed into the image of Jesus. And then the last thing uh, uh, to kind of replace the habits is the what I'm calling the cruciform life. Okay, and, and, and here's what I mean by the, the cruciform life. The primary actor in your formation is the Holy Spirit, uh, but there is personal responsibility. God uh, invites you in to participate in your own formation into the image of Jesus in his grace. And this is what Paul talks about when he says like walking by the Spirit or putting to death what is earthly in you or putting on the things of Christ or, you know, uh, in Romans 12, he says that you should offer your bodies as living sacrifices so that you are transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind, not conformed in, uh, uh, um, to the world kind of a thing. Like this is what he's talking about. This is a way of living life. And essentially why I call it the cruciform life is that it's doing what Jesus did. It's living the way Jesus did. Classically, historically, the church has just called these the spiritual disciplines um, uh, or practices or, or habits or something like that. Um, living the cruciform life is summed up when Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me and die to himself daily, right? It's, there's a way of living life, that self-sacrifice, that cruciform life of, of um, actually like working with our hands and with our feet and like getting on our knees and, and kind of a thing, like the, the way of living our lives, walking through the world, so to speak. There's a way of doing that in which that will actually not just be an overflow of what's going on inside of us, but can actually contribute to what is going on inside of us. Um, this is why um, I like our core team that we're training um, right now to come with Austin, come to Austin with us. We um, uh, oftentimes, and I've done this with our, my college ministry in Waco when I, when I led there and stuff like that, um, is that when we would pray as a team, like as a leadership team or something like that, I would often invite people to, to get on their knees when they pray. There's nothing magic that happens when you get on your knees, but your body is taking a posture of dependence and reverence. And so like if you, op- if you get on your knees and you open your hands when you pray, and I highly encourage you to do this like in your individual walk with Jesus. Um, uh, get on your knees, open your hands, and pray. It, it doesn't make Jesus more in love with you. It doesn't, you know, the Father's not more inclined to answer your request if you do this, but what you're doing is your body is taking a posture of dependence and submission that will train your heart to function in a posture of dependence and submission. Um, James K.A. Smith has, has great books about how this can be done. It, it talks about in Desiring in the Kingdom and You Are What You Love. Um, both of them, um, he talks about how the power of what you do physically, your habits, um, what you do on the outside can actually function to transform you on the inside, not just the other way around, the way we t- tend to emphasize it. Okay. Okay. So summary of what we've all covered so far. I know it's been a ton. Here, here it is. Um, Your people are being formed and have been formed, whether you teach them or not. So all Christian formation is also Um, counter-formation. They've been deformed by the world and by their flesh. And and so our job is not to get them from 0 to 10. It's to get them from negative 17 to to 10 or whatever it is. Okay, By the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not actually our job. We get to participate in it. Um, uh, And the three ways that people are formed are through what they believe, their stories, who they're with, their community, and what they do, their habits, and the way that we help to form people into the image of Jesus through umbrella term teaching is scripture, the community of God, the church, 
and through the cruciform life, or spiritual disciplines if you'd rather, okay? All right, so let's let that inform how we um, uh, teach and preach and train, okay? All right, so now we're, we're back to teaching, and here, here's, here's what I want to give you. I want to give you these three categories, teaching, preaching, and training. Again, teaching, kind of that Greek word, um, that uh, uh, Jesus, or that is used about Jesus when it says that he went teaching in the synagogues. Uh, that Greek word is didasko. It's where we get the word didactic. Um, this is probably um, uh, in our culture, in our day and age. You know, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm certainly. I mean, I might get to preaching, but I'm teaching right now. Right? Um, very didactic. This is very technical. Um, uh, I've got like a. Um, uh, you're taking notes. That's a big. Like if you're preaching and people are taking notes, you're not preaching very well. You know what I'm saying? And we'll talk about why in a second. If you're teaching and people are taking notes, either they're good students or you're doing a good job, or both. You know. And so um, didactic is what, what you experience in a classroom, in school. Um, teaching might be like in a seminar, or um, uh, you can even teach through writing, like blogs, or even I think I would say like for a ministry purpose, a teaching could be handing them a book. You know, if you've got a book that's changed your life, that maybe a theology textbook type of thing, or, or not a textbook, but a, a one that's going to really kind of reach their head, that's the main focus, that's, that's what teaching is. Um, I'm going to give you a real definition of it here. Teaching, in the way that we're using the word here, the didasco, is the explanation of biblical and theological truth. It's the explanation of biblical and theological truth. The main goal of teaching is information. Okay, so there may be teaching that exists in a sermon or, um, uh, or even in a training that we're going to talk about, but the main goal of preaching and training is not information. We're, we're going to get there. The main goal of teaching is the explanation of biblical and theological truth. This is, this is uh, information um, heavy, okay? And so, you know, like for example, I can explain to you like a particular passage of scripture, like what it means by showing you its context, its grammatical features, that kind of a thing. You know, like I can, this is historically what they would have used this word to mean, and so blah, 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 that kind of stuff. That's, that's teaching. Or I could teach you like, um, uh, 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 like the doctrine of the Trinity, like the history of it, the biblical passages that, that we get the idea of the Trinity from and like the history of, of the couple centuries that it took for us to come up with that idea, the councils, all stuff. I'm going to teach you all of that, okay? That's teaching you. It's delivering you information that helps you best to love God with your mind, right? Remember, Matthew uh, 28, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. What's the most important commandment, to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So this, this focuses on the head, if you will. Um, this focuses on the, the mind. A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into your minds when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Um, it doesn't mean teaching is the most important of the three, but it's important, okay? Um, so obviously, I, I mentioned this, teaching does exist in preaching, um, if your sermon doesn't include some teaching, your people are just going to be lost. Because like I said, they're biblically illiterate. They need some information given to them before you can call them to any kind of action, right? But, um, uh, but teaching heavy environments would be stuff like classes, seminars, that kind of a thing. And my, my argument to you, my, my suggestion and kind of my plea to you is that, um, uh, that you create some sort of environment, strategy, whatever you want to call it, in your ministry that, that is teaching heavy. Um, these three things, what we're going to do is we're going to treat them as, as building blocks for a successful umbrella term teaching ministry, okay? That's my goal. And so with, with teaching didasco, the, the subcategory there, like you need to figure out a way that your ministry teaches people, okay? Um, many of you, you've got training and preaching, but maybe you don't have as much teaching. And so you're calling a lot of people to action. You're inviting them and, and exhorting them to apply the Word of God to their life. That's preaching. We'll talk about that. And, and maybe you're in small groups where they're getting to see people um, uh, live like Jesus, getting to see the prayer and, and all that stuff. Like, that's really, really, really good. 
Um, but many of them are lacking some information that they really need um, because they didn't grow up with it. Like, if it, like I had a, a seminary pro, uh, professor, uh, a New Testament uh, scholar as a dad. This is probably, the teaching part was probably the least of my needs. Um, I'm, I needed a lot of preaching and mostly a lot of training. I would imagine most people in your college ministry are the exact opposite of me. Most people don't grow up with New Testament scholars as dads, right? And, and most of your people didn't even grow up in Sunday school or training union or, you know, life group or, or whatever, okay? And so they need teaching. That's, that's all I'll say about that. The next one is preaching. Uh, preaching, the definition is the invitation and exhortation to believe and apply biblical and theological truth. So um, I, I mentioned, I'll say that again, the, invent, the invitation and exhortation to believe and apply biblical truth. So if I was to give you a quote that like your audience, like if somebody was asking you to do one of these three things, kind of a thing, the one for teaching would be tell me, right? Teaching is tell me. Preaching is move me. Teaching is delivering information about something. Preaching is speaking to them in such a way that they don't just learn about the thing, they experience the thing, right? Um, uh, uh, and so uh, this kind of thing, you, you're not going to get preaching um, in your typical like classroom setting or something like that, um, or like a breakout or whatever at a, at a conference, um, because it really is like to proclaim or to herald. Um, it, it, this is not analyzing scripture, it's holding it up. This is not teaching about Jesus, it's putting him on display where someone experiences the love and the truth uh, of Jesus. Um, uh, it's not analytical or explanatory. Um, it's not just to tell someone about the truth, it's to hold up the truth in such a way that people are moved to act on it. Um, that's that invitation or exhortation. Um, to give you kind of uh, some pictures of this, this is what Jesus does when he says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. This is like the central message of Jesus. He goes around preaching this, proclaiming this. That's the, the word cariso that they, they use in the gospels to explain that. Um, so that's what Jesus did. Um, it's what the women did when they find the empty tomb. They go and they proclaim, they herald the good news of uh, Jesus Christ. I'm a complementarian. Don't let, don't let anyone ever tell you that women can't preach. They preach, they must preach. Okay? Um, uh, um, and and you can, we, can, we can clarify what I mean by that if you're confused or offended or something like that. Okay? But, um, uh, uh, and then, like, so what Peter does at, at Acts 2 at Pentecost, right? He preaches. He gets up and he proclaims the good news. We're going to talk about that uh, in just a second. Okay, so preaching is essential for spiritual formation because it moves us to love God with all of our heart. Um, if you've been around, if you've done a lot of reading on preaching and stuff like that, there's this kind of, uh, among expository preachers, there's this uh, uh, new, it's not new, it's, it's like in the last decade or so, but there's this new focus on preaching to the heart is a lot of the language. Um, so if you'll hear Keller use that or Brian Chapel or um, Phil, uh, uh, not Philip Yancey, Yancey Arrington, that kind of stuff. So um, uh, preaching to the heart. It, preaching, the goal of preaching is to, like I said, inv invite and exhort people to believe and apply the biblical truth. Another way of saying that would be it's to stir their affections and their allegiances to the truth. It's to win someone's heart. Um, so uh, by the way, that's, that's you know, when, when you talk about belief and the word faith in the New Testament, the word pistis is the Greek word there. It does mean to like, it is not less than mentally assenting to the facts of the gospel, meaning like to believe that it's true, right? You have to believe that it's true to have faith in it, but it's a whole lot more than that. It's not less than that, but it's a whole lot more than that. In fact, the, the way I like to talk about it is it's pledging allegiance to the truth. It's, it's in, the, in the biblical view, the heart is not just the seat of the emotions, it's the seat of the will. It's where your allegiance are. Like if you have an idol, it's in your heart kind of a thing. I don't mean that biologically, I just mean that in the biblical worldview. Um, in fact, it's the word cardia, which means gut. It means like your gut, which is funny. Side note, this is probably, I'm being recorded, so I probably shouldn't say this, or whatever. It's really funny. If you want to take any time, um, like, like in Philemon, uh, when Paul calls Onesimus his heart, 
Um, and, and he says heart a lot in Philemon. Go and translate that. Uh, you can translate like intestines or bowels or something like that. Go do that. If you, if you read Greek at all, if you don't, it's totally fine. Right? Or you, you read your Bible and just replace it. It's hilarious. You should do it. It's just funny, okay? Um, side note, it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's just really funny. My Greek professor in seminary had us do that, and it was just a good time. Okay, so it's, it's your gut. It's the core of who you are. It's where your will comes from. It's where your, your allegiances lie. We in Western culture think of it as up here. When you think of uh, belief, you think here. Like, you can almost feel it, right? When I say faith, you, you almost feel your head. In, in ancient Greek, the ancients, they would have felt down here. They would have thought of it here. This is what moves you. It's the core of who you are. That's what we're going after when we, when we preach. We're trying to stir people's affections. We're trying to change people's allegiances. Okay? Um, uh, for most churches, the primary venue for preaching is going to be the Sunday gathering. That's, uh, I think that's awesome. I think we should keep doing that. Um, uh, however, if preaching is limited to the pulpit in your, in your ministry or your church, there's not enough preaching going on. Um, uh, proclamation of the gospel, that going after people's hearts, must be just permeating all through your ministry. Um, because here's the deal, man. One 30-minute or 45-minute or 60-minute sermon, if your pastor really thinks he's good, um, uh, uh, that's not going to compete with the 24-7 inundating that your people are getting from content everywhere else. Everywhere else. One study did that. Even Christian millennials, even Christian millennials, one hour in every 20 hours of content they take in digitally is any kind of Christian. That's for Christian millennials. That one hour of every 20 hours of content they take in digitally is at all described as Christian. Like your people are being formed. And if you're depending on a Sunday sermon to form them in the other way, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so preaching has to permeate the very life of your people. People need to be preaching to one another. You need to be preaching to yourself that kind of stuff, okay? So the proclamation of the gospel must saturate every environment in the life of the church. All right, I'm done preaching about preaching. Now let's go to the, the last one, training. So that's the one that doesn't have an actual word. And, and, and I think that says something, right? So in that Matthew 4, 23, Jesus goes and he didascos, he teaches, he carisos, he preaches, and there's no word. And the reason why is because it's action. He, 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 he just, they just, they don't say like, there's no summary term. They just say what he did. You know, you get what I'm saying? And, and because training, if teaching is tell me and preaching is move me, training is show me. Training is show me. And training um, is the method by which we give people the means to apply biblical and theological truth to their lives. So teaching, we tell them, we, in, we explain biblical truth. In preaching, we invite and exhort people to believe and apply uh, biblical truth. And in training, we give them the means how to apply the, the biblical truth. We show them how to apply it to their lives. Um, and, and Jesus taught about, uh, uh, Jesus taught about the kingdom. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. And then he demonstrated the coming of the kingdom by healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, casting out demons, and, and the like. Um, but as we read in Matthew 10, um, it wasn't just, hey, come watch me demonstrate the kingdom. He's like, hey, come watch me demonstrate the kingdom. A few chapters later, hey, all the things that you just saw me do, now it's your turn. You go and do this. Think about this, like Jesus, like when Jesus feeds the 5,000, who passes out and picks up the baskets? Did Jesus baptize anyone? No, John says the disciples baptized them, right? In fact, in fact, in the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples come to him and said, these people are hungry. Let's send them to go home to get some food. And what does Jesus say? You feed them. Like, like Jesus is, is involving his people in what he is doing so that he can send them out. He's training them. He's showing them what it means to be a fisher of men. He's showing them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And this is why I think Jesus says in the Great Commission, he doesn't say, teach them about all the things that I have commanded. He says, teach them to obey the things that I have commanded. And here's the reality, and I'm preaching about training right now, and I apologize that I'm not teaching about training, and I can't actually train about training. 
That's weird. I don't know how you would actually train about training. I mean, I'd be training you. Anyway, okay, so, but here's the thing. Most churches um, in, in probably, uh, you know, evangelical, conservative, um, uh, Bible-believing kind of context and stuff, which that's what I am. I fully believe in that kind of stuff. Most of us have got teaching and preaching down, and we really lack in training. There are a lot, there are a lot of lessons and sermons taught and preached on things like prayer, things like evangelism, things like disciple making, things like Sabbath, whatever it is. There is very little showing people how to do it. In fact, many of you, it's very likely, this is not a judgment call, it's very likely that you have a lot of information on prayer and evangelism and have never seen anybody do it. And it's very likely that you're thinking right now, I don't know how to train my people in prayer. Why? Because you've never been trained in prayer. You've been taught about prayer. You've been preached at that you should pray. But nobody's invited you to their home and let you just pray with them. Nobody's invited you to this group that they have every week at six o'clock in the morning where they get together and they just pray for the lost. You've never been to like uh, an organized like prayer meeting, that kind of a thing. Like, like you, you know what happens in prayer, you know the theology of prayer, you know why we should pray, you know that we should pray, you know the ACTS method, you know ACTS or pray, pray method or, or whatever. You know all of those acronyms and stuff like that. But you've just never sat some, with somebody who's like a prayer. You know what I mean? Like a prayer warrior. You've never just sat with somebody and then just been like, that's how you pray. You know? Like, like, and, and prayer is just an example. It could be anything. Um, prayer is just one of the probably prominent examples of things that people don't know how to do because they don't see it. They just hear it talked about. Training is where we show people what we're teaching and preaching to them. So we show them how to do this. In fact, if you want, the Hottie Lewis, one of the best in the world at this. One of the best in the world at this. Um, he, um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the exact thing. Um, the way he does residency is they come and live with him. Like they, they come and live with him. Or, or they, we showed a video of John and Melina James, uh, some of y'all, who, who's from there? Yeah, right? Like, man, the training, uh, uh, you didn't happen to live with them, did you? I don't live with them, but I live right next to them. But you're always at their house? Bro, you don't even know what you're being trained in half the time, right? Like, you're, you're I'm just trying to think of things of, uh, like what she said in the video, like you're picking up toys with her. Yeah, you're with their kids all the time. You're just playing with their kids. You think you're, I mean, you're probably aware of what's going on because it's on videos and stuff, but... Um, but like you're thinking, I'm just here helping them with their kids, having some fun, getting some coffee. You think you're being like, like served and that kind of a thing. You're also learning how to be a mom, right? And, and no, I, I imagine at no time Melina is like, let me teach you how to be a mom. But like when it comes to time for being a mom, you're not a mom, are you? Right? Good. Cool. So um, if, you, if and when you become a mom, you're going to have some, and you might not even be able to recall it to memory. It's going to be muscle memory. It's just, you're just going to be like, I, like you're going to subconsciously think, how did Melina do this? Right? Like that, that's, this is what you do with your parents. How many of you are married? Right? How, how, how many times have you realized, depending on how long you've been, how many times you realize that the mistakes you're making in marriage are the same mistakes you've watched your parents make? Or you're not making those mistakes because you watched your parents make those mistakes. You were trained and you had no idea you were being trained. And so we're training these people. We're showing them what it means to follow Jesus. Okay, so uh, I, need to, I need to move through quickly. You need all three environments in your ministry. You need teaching environments, you need preaching environments, and you need training environments. You need to tell people the stuff they need to know. You need to invite and exhort them to apply it to their lives, and then you must show them how. Okay, and I want to talk about one. What time is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really quickly. And then hopefully we got 15 minutes to kind of talk about this stuff. Really quickly, I want to focus right now on preaching for spiritual formation, like in, in, in a sermon. But I think this will be applicable to any kind of these environments, any of these environments. And so if you're like, I don't ever preach, like, please, like, take this and apply it 
to whatever it is that environment you think this would, this would work for. Um, so if you're taking all the information we got, you got teaching, training, and uh, teaching, preaching, and training. These are the three things Jesus did to form his disciples. We know how people are being formed. They're being formed by their stories, their community, and their, and their habits. And we know that they're formed into the image of Jesus through scripture, through the church, and through the cruciform life. How do we take all of that and in the act of one sermon, go after all of that? Okay. Um, and here, here, here's, here's, I'm going to kind of just help you a little bit, um, give you a window into kind of how I think about um, uh, when I'm writing a sermon, how I think about how I'm going to communicate when I'm communicating, okay? So you can assume like I've got a text, we're in the middle of a series or something like that. And, and, and so this is like as I am writing my sermon or even as I'm delivering it oftentimes, like these are the things that are in my head. And again, that's not to hold myself as an example. I've learned this from, from many other people. Okay, so um, uh, here's, here's, here's what I do. I like to think of it this way. I want to preach the story, capital T, capital S. I want to preach the story by preaching to the stories, lowercase, their stories, and my story. Okay, I, I, preaching for spiritual formation, I think, is preaching the story of the scriptures by preaching the stories, lowercase, their stories, and my story. And, and so we're going to walk through these, and I'm going to give uh, kind of more, that's an easy way to remember it, but I'm going to give you more kind of clarifying definitions of these. Um, so preaching, so we're preaching the story, but here let's talk about preaching the stories, lowercase, plural. You must preach and teach culturally and counterculturally at the same time. You must preach culturally and counterculturally. And so, like we've said, the culture and the stories that come with the culture is just the water that your people are swimming in. The dominant narratives, they, they don't even know it, but this is what they believe and it's how they even come up with what they believe. It's the framework by which they interpret the world. And so this means two things. First, you must preach, you must preach and teach in such a way that makes sense to the culture. It does nobody any good for you to preach in a language they don't speak. You must preach in a way that makes sense to the culture. So easy example would be avoid Christianese. Right? It's an easy, easy example. I have people tell, and, and the other main preacher in our college ministry in Lubbock is, is a lot worse at it than I am. Uh, but I get told all the time that that's a Christian word. That's a, that's a word that you probably don't have to use. You can figure out something else. Um, that kind of a thing. Preach in a way that the culture understands, but that at the same time defies the truths that the culture teaches, unless the culture is teaching a truth that we can get on board with. Right? But, um, uh, so it's, Cultural, it's also countercultural, right? Um, and, and, and this is, this is important. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll stick there. I, I would love to do more explanation, and, and you can come ask if you want, um, but for sake of time, I'll just I'll move on. So preaching culturally and counterculturally, preaching in a way that makes sense to the culture and also challenges the culture. Um, and two, uh, by the way, one, one thing about this, you must preach culturally. You must even if you are in the most rural, southern, Bible Belt town, your people are on social media. Like, if, it's, if the old people in your town don't think that way, in like the way the dominant culture is thinking, your college students absolutely do. Absolutely do. And, so, and, and they don't know it, and so you must tell them. You do them a service by telling them what the culture is teaching them. So I'll often in a sermon, I'll often start this way and then get more to their stories. I'll start with, here's what the culture believes about whatever we're talking about. These are the things that you're hearing. And, 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 and so I'm not really informing them of anything because they're all like, yeah, yeah totally, I, that, that is what. But I'll, I'll bring up like a New York Times article. This is depending on who I'm talking to, what age group, that kind of thing. It might be a New York Times article. It may be um, uh, um, something that they might hear from social media um, or a Disney movie or whatever. Like, uh, you're going to point out, how is the culture talking about this? I want to point that out so that they can recognize it, because I'm also teaching them to interpret the culture through a biblical lens, right? Like, I don't want them to watch Frozen and think that their identity and what makes them valuable comes from inside, right? I don't, I don't want them to think that, okay? So, um, uh, so that's, that's one. Two, 
Preach to your people's experiences. This is preach to their stories. So we got these stories and we got their stories. Preach to your people, people's experiences. Your people's experiences. The culture is general. This is about the people that you preach to. The truth that you're preaching doesn't just speak to the culture. It speaks to every individual in your congregation or in your large gathering or whatever context we're talking about. Each person is bringing their own individual stories, their own life experiences with them. And it's your job as the preacher or the teacher or whatever, it's your job to help them interpret those experience and experiences in light of the truth, right? And so you actually do serve your people, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying really hard to get good at this. You serve your people um, by um, giving them language to describe their experiences, to describe their own stories that they're bringing to the table, to describe to them what it is that they believe, you need to be able to articulate what they believe better than they can, right? Um, And then um, then tell them how they feel. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not saying like assign things that aren't true to your people. That's not what I'm saying. But if you know your people, this requires the saying goes, smell like your sheep. This requires this. Like if you're going to be a good teacher, preacher, whatever, you need to be in the lives of your people. There, there is just no such good thing. There's no such thing as a good shepherd who is a green room preacher. You know what I mean by green room preacher, right? Um, if, if you're in the back room and not interacting with the people, I don't mean necessarily in the moment of preaching. Some of us need that alone time. That's totally okay. But I mean, just all the time, the only thing, the only interaction your people have with you is when you're on stage and they're in the seats, you're not going to be a very good preacher to that the individual group of people. Okay, so you need to be able to help them interpret their experiences, give them language to interpret their experiences, what they believe and how it makes them feel in a way that they can't because it helps them. You're identifying where they are, right? Like you would never say this. Please do not ever say this. But like to use that number scale analogy that I've used a couple of times, like they need to, they need to know that they're at a negative 12. They need to know that. You'd be like, listen, like you're at a negative 12, and we need to get it in, at a positive seven kind of a thing, right? Again, that's like a numerical way of kind of giving an illustration here. But you need to tell them uh, what, what they believe, you know? So um, uh, maybe a real-life example. I'm taking too long on this. But uh, a real-life example for like a college student in particular. Um, uh, I mean, dude, I mean, and I'll say there are some of you here who are addicted to pornography, the word addicted is not a word they use. They say, I watch pornography. <laughs> like, no, 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 you're addicted to pornography. And it's shaping who you are. It's forming you. Um, there are some of you here who are obsessed with the approval of others. They would say that they like being liked. And I would say you're worshiping the God of approval. You know, that kind of, you know what I'm saying? And, and it's always coming off pastorally. We're going to get there. Um, it's always coming off pastorally. I'm being very crass and like quick with this. That's not how it comes off when I preach, I really hope. Um, uh, and so, but I'm telling them what they believe. And then also it's like, and many of you, you're addicted to pornography and nobody knows and you feel alone. I'm telling you how you feel because they know that, but nobody's ever said it. And, and they're thinking, you're right. I'm addicted to pornography and nobody knows and I'm alone. Okay. So uh, you tell, you're preaching to their stories. And then the third one, you must preach authentically and pastorally, meaning you must preach to your story. Um, uh, uh, you should never, ever be the center of attention when you preach and teach. However, it's important that your people relate to you. And in today's culture, few in, this, this is, there's several reasons why. In today's culture, one reason is fewer and fewer of your people will automatically respect the preacher as authoritative. You don't carry with you inherent authority because you're behind the pulpit or in whatever position. In fact, it may it may go in the other direction. Um, They're probably mostly suspicious of you. Um, And um, so that means, one, you need to point to the fact that this is not your idea, but it comes from, even if they don't believe the Bible, it comes from an ancient venerated book that works kind of a thing, right? And so it it comes from something beyond yourself. Um, It comes from the Lord. Um, uh, And and that's one thing to say is that your preaching needs to come from the Bible. I'm assuming that. Okay. And then um, and then uh, the other reason why you need to preach authentically and pastorally in a way that people can relate to you um, is that um, 
that is, that's kind of the value of, this is, this is speaking culturally. That's kind of the value that your people likely have. They're more likely to trust you if they know you more than your credentials, right? Like I could get up on stage and I could say, I read Greek and I have an MDiv. That means I've mastered the divinity, right? And, um, and some of my seminary professors wrote commentaries that your pastors growing up, like, read and stuff like that. My dad was a New Testament scholar, is a New Testament scholar kind of thing. I have all the information. I would get no respect. No respect. My resume does not matter. What matters is that I care about them and they know me. People do not give a crap what you know until they know that you care. They do not care what you know until they know that you care. And and the way to communicate to them that you know that you care is that you can tell them, hey, this truth that we're talking about, like, like, hey, look, man, you're at a negative 12. I remember when I was at a negative 12. Here's a story about me being at negative 12. And here's the story of how I got to seven. Because then you become a real life example of how this is possible. Kind of a thing. And you you need to be that for your, your people. So if you're not confessing sin regularly from a stage, you need to do it appropriately, but you need to do it. Um, and you need to preach pastorally, right? I will often yell at my people and then go, I'm speaking to you guys not as this preacher who's got it all together, but as like a big brother or a father figure. That like, I, I preached Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is all about this guy who, you know, went and th- uh, basically threw it all away by partying and all this stuff. And he found out that that's not the way to live life, that kind of a thing. And um, I was like, bro, I'm just telling you, some of you are in this. You're, you're, going, you're going for the sex, the drugs, the alcohol, all that stuff. I want to let you know, for, as, as a big brother, been there, done that, left me empty. I'm speaking pastorally. I'm not conde- I am condemning the sin, but I'm not in a judgmental way it's a, as a pastoral, a pastoral voice in warning, saying I've been there. Don't make the same mistake that I made, that kind of a thing. All right, uh, authentically, pastorally. The last thing that's preaching your story, and then the last thing is you need to preach the story, meaning you need to preach Christocentrically. Christ must be the center of everything that you teach and preach. Uh, we are Christians. We read the Bible through the lens of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, and if you're going to preach the story of the Bible, which is the story that we must get down deep into the core of their being, if you're going to preach that, then we preach it through the lens of the person and work uh, of, um, uh, of Jesus. And so... Um, one way to say this, um, no matter what text or topic that you're, you're, you're speaking on, uh, that you must always help your people in your thing. You, you need to be telling that story through the lens of the main story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, right? So like one, so preaching Christocentrically is holding Jesus up. And you're preaching, in this case, holding Jesus up in a way that people are experiencing Jesus. They're seeing the beauty of Jesus. At the same time, they're also learning the entire story of the Bible with every single sermon. Like if I'm preaching Ecclesiastes, uh, like, you know, uh, it's weird because Jihadi just did it. Uh, uh, if I, if I uh, am preaching Ecclesiastes 5, I preached Ecclesiastes 5 several weeks ago. If I preach that, I want to preach it in such a way that people know how Ecclesiastes 5 fits into the entire story of Scripture and how it finds its climax in Jesus that everything finds its fulfillment in Jesus, right? I want, I, want to, I want to do that every single time. In my case, I get on stage and preach, right? Um, every single time. So, so one, last, one last run through of all that. I want to preach culturally and counterculturally to preach to, their, to these stories. I want to preach to, your peop, or to my people's, or you want to preach to your people's experiences to preach to their stories. And I want to preach authentically and pastorally, preach to your story, and I want to preach Christocentrically. I want to preach the story. All right? Um, and so I am, I'm a preacher. And so we're just about out of time. We have uh, two minutes until 2.15. So um, uh, you, are, you are free to go. I want to pray for you real quick. Um, but then you are free to go. And then uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to, to talk, whatever. I'm, I'm around. Um, I, I, hope, I hope that was helpful to you. I, 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 I pray that was helpful to you. If you are interested... Um, uh, I'm going to get you to write your email in this book right here, this nice one that I just got, you know, um, and uh, write your email on this page, 
and I will send you uh, this thing that, that I'm looking at right now, which is like a whole um, class. It's actually got more than what we talked about on preaching, teaching, and training for spiritual formation that I'm, that I'm drawing all this from. I will send it to you, um, and, and you can have it if you're somebody who like doesn't learn audibly at all and you need something written down. Like I'll give that to you. So if you want, you can come up here. I've got a pen, and you can you can write down your email, and I'd love to send it to you. Um, but let me pray for you, and then, and then you can go. Father, I just thank you for this group of people, um, and I thank you for, in your grace, involving us in the work of forming people into the image of the Son. Wow. First of all, God, I thank you for forming us into the image of the Son. That there are particular stories in this room of, of you. Um, calling people to yourself, drawing them in. God, it, it, I mean, this is incredible. You inform them of their sin. You inform them of who you are and how much you love them. You move their hearts to be convicted of sin and to, to be attracted to the beauty of, of you and your love and, and your sacrifice for them and the life that you were calling them to. And Father, you show us how through your Holy Spirit and through your church and through your scriptures, you show us how to follow Jesus and to be formed into the image of the Son. Father, you do this in our lives. And so I thank you for that fact. And I pray that you would help us and help these folks do it for the people that you have called them to lead and that they would do that faithfully. Father, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.